Thank you all for joining. While we're waiting for everyone to come on, if you could please take a, a moment to fill out our opening poll. Um, we'd like to get a sense of the audience and the sentiment today. Thank you again for all tuning in. Thanks for those who have just joined us. If you could just take a moment to fill out this poll and then we will get started very shortly. Thanks again for tuning in and for those who have only just joined us. We've got a poll here and we'd love to gauge the audience sentiment. So thank you for filling that in. Shortly we will post the results and then we'll kick off the session today. So I think we can share the results now if Okay, thank you. So kia ora Tato. now my heri mai. Welcome everyone. My name is Cassia Aksanov and I'm the Partnerships and Relationships Manager at the Trans-Tasman Business Circle. I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of this land and pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. For they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. I'm speaking to you today from the land of the Gay Margul people. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's virtual briefing, Devolving the CX and EX Journey in the New Normal, featuring Ryan Lester, Director, Customer Engagement Technologies, Log Me In, and Dr. Stephen, Steve Nuttall, Director, Fifth Quadrant. This briefing is the second briefing in a three-part series, and the next briefing will be held on Thursday, the 6th of August. On behalf of the circle, I'd like to thank our series partner, Log Me In. The discussion today will be moderated by Paul Smith, IT editor, AFR. Great to have you with us again, Paul. We'll begin with a moderated conversation between Ryan and Steve, and then open up to the audience. Please submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Some background on our guest speakers. Ryan Lester is the Senior Director of Customer Experience Technology at LogMeIn. Ryan's team owns the strategic development and implementation for the go-to market plan for AI, chatbot and virtual assistant products at LogMeIn. Ryan is passionate about making new technology easy and helping any size company unlock the potential of AI and bots. Dr. Steve Nuttall is a Director and Partner of Fifth Quadrant a customer experience strategy design and research company. Fifth Quadrant provides Steve with the opportunity to provide outstanding solutions to taxing business questions. Steve is particularly passionate about helping clients deliver on their customer centricity strategies and business performance goals. I hope you enjoy the event today and over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Cassia. Uh, thanks for having me here as well, and, and thanks to the two, two guys for joining me. Um, the title of this session today was around evolving the CX and EX journey in the new normal. So um, given the title, you'd, you'd assume that most of the people that have signed up to watch uh, are kind of already interested in this area. Uh, but I'd like to turn to Ryan first, um, just to get a bit of a rundown from you of some of the issues that you've been tackling over the last few months, and to sort of give a, an idea to some of the people in the audience about yourself and, and, your, and your expertise in case for some crazy reason they're not already familiar with you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much. And thanks, Paul, for, for uh, guiding us through this conversation today. And Steve, great to spend time with you again. I always enjoy our conversations. You too, Ryan. Uh, so to start out, I, I have a very global perspective. Um, you know, I, 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 before pre-COVID, I traveled quite frequently, um, both to the, uh, the ANZ Australian market, uh, and then also to just a broader global perspective. And you know, certainly we're all in a very dynamic time. Um, if you already hadn't thought about digital transformation, the current environment is one that will force your hand and have every company's rethinking how they support their employees, how they engage with their customers, enabling remote work, um, and taking a, oftentimes a digital first approach. 
And so the conversations I'm having every day with companies, uh, whether that's a CX professional, a customer service org, or even an IT organization that's trying to enable uh, a better uh, and more productive workforce who might now be working from home, it's really about how do we look at the current situation? How do we get ahead of it? How do we continue to delight our customers um, when we're looking at potentially a longer term recession or at least a very challenging uh, environment? Uh, and how do we look at that to, to make our customers feel like they're still you know, getting a first class experience, that we're meeting our SLAs, but we're doing it in an environment that's changing week to week and month to month. So a big conversation around that is what are new technologies we can be leveraging? How do we still stay kind of shoulder to shoulder or elbow to elbow with our customers and with our employees, um, but do it in a way that works at scale, that's secure, and that still delivers a high quality experience and when we can track and learn and improve. So, so a, lot of, a lot of things we're gonna touch on today is you know, this kind of transformation that's happened and it's been pushed upon us, how that's impacted our existing processes and how technology can help us you know, still deliver great customer experiences and great employee experiences, but doing that at scale. Mm, I'm saying so. Plenty of areas to cover. I'd just like to bring Steve in there as well, because there might be some people watching that aren't familiar with Fifth Quadrant. So uh, I'm wondering sort of your perspective on, on all this. So if you maybe take the frame of reference of the last crazy few months and, and the kind of work that you've been doing in that area and, and use that to sort of explain where, what it is you do, Steve. Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Paul. And, you know, again, sort of similar points there that, that Ryan's making. You know, look, prior to COVID, our remit was to help organisations um, become uh, more mature organizations in terms of their the customer experience that they deliver. So, you know, our focus is around uh, optimizing CX strategy and helping organizations on the execution of that. And, and really, you know, nothing's really kind of changed as a consequence of COVID. That's just become more, more of an intense problem. Um, you know, the, those who are, who are CX leaders um, have, you know, we've seen that CX leaders have adjusted and adapted to the COVID situation far better than those who are laggards and, and, and followers. And, and I think they're, they're pulling apart leaders from the rest of the pack. Um, so, you know, quite increasingly, you know, we're getting those CX laggards now coming, up, coming to us where, you know, kind of CX was a bit of an afterthought or something that wasn't really a key priority because, um, other factors were, uh, you know, of greater importance. Now this become a, an area of of, of great focus. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing with those kind of organisations now is getting there and doing, you know, a very detailed diagnostic, benchmarking, comparing, identifying kind of key key break points in terms of how they uh, service customers and and so on. Um, but we can't do that in the in the in the timeframes that we might have done that in the past. You know, these might have been you know, three to six months engagement. Now it's a three to six week engagement, if not shorter. You know, we need to fix this now. Mm. Uh, and if we, um, if we're, probably, we're coming up on what, five months yeah. since the um, the lockdown era era began. And so it was almost this period when it first started, it felt like as a sort of just industry observer in general, that we went through where it was necessity breeding invention. Everyone just had to suddenly work out how the hell to keep going and what and what, what they needed to do to, to work in this way. Um, so if we sort of rewind a little bit before we look forward, uh, what were the biggest challenges that you saw organisations trying to navigate? Steve already mentioned that there were some way ahead of others. Um, and this can be from both the customer and the employee perspective. I'll go to you first, Ryan, on that. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, the first thing that we saw really companies focus on was kind of uh, fortifying their customer service or their kind of frontline experience. Uh, you know, many in many organizations had to close their contact centers. Uh, everybody had to shift to remote work. Consumers could no longer walk into a store or maybe use traditional channels like phone to get the support they required. So a lot of it initially was just around how do we fortify it so that we're still delivering uh, some customer experience, uh, but we're doing it at scale in a way that, you know, isn't gonna break our organization and, and, and burn out our people. So really the initial focus was really on that fortification. Then it was around the kind of optimization of saying, okay, well, where now are our consumers engaging? Um, you know, are they coming to our website and do we need to improve things like self-service? Or are they now, you know, engaging us through new channels like let's say WhatsApp? Um, because, you know, rather than them wanting to sit on hold or knowing that there's gonna be a long hold time, 
you know, they're they're fed up and they need an answer to their question and they're going to send us a message instead. So it was really you know once again starting with that fortification of being there for our customers, answering their questions and being upfront and honest of saying, "Hey, you know, our contact center is going to have an hour wait time. Here are other ways you can in, uh, find the information you need." Um, and then secondarily starting to then optimize for where consumers were starting to coalesce and optimizing around how employees were starting to work. So once again, maybe it's on a tablet at their home or now shifting them to digital because you know they have a kid crying in the background and they can no longer do a phone call. Um, so those were some of those optimization things that to Steve's point, com some companies were already going down that road and had a kind of a, a leading advantage and others were learning for the first time and then trying to optimize over the last five months. Actually, I forgot to mention, sorry, when, when we, we started off that um, Cassia said at the start of, of this briefing that we'd have questions and answers at the end, but please do submit your yes. questions to the chat yeah. thing throughout this, because I can see it on my screen now, the wonders of not being up on a stage hosting these things mm -hmm. and doing them remotely, so I can just integrate the questions into the conversation as if I thought of them myself and look clever, so it's, <laughs> it's all good, so please do send them through. And so Steve, just following on from what Ryan was just saying there. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned in, in your first, but there was obviously some laggards and some companies that were way ahead. Um, how yeah. how did you discern those, and and and, and what? Uh, I guess the, the the laggard ones were the ones that needed the most help. Can you sort of look, look back on what the what the challenges were, and and in getting to the stage where people could just keep working? Correct, and I, th I think the first the first challenge, you know, is is not about um, what technology should I invest in, but it's more about what do I need to do from a people perspective. Um, so, you know, I think, again, I totally agree with, with Ryan here in terms of the phases that we went through. You know, phase one was just, can I get a dial tone for my people? Because my biggest challenge is to how do, we, how do I enable a remote workforce? And, and that was literally, it was, and, and, and overnight, you know, I, I've got maybe 48 hours to, to enable this. So, you know, those, you know, I think, I think leaders who already had the right culture of trust in their people already in place, um, you know, were, had staff who were um, able to, um, who were much more able to respond to customer queries. You know, we're seeing a huge spike in the volume of queries, but it's not just the volume, it's also the complexity of the query as well. So you need people who can build that high level of empathy with with customers you know we're not dealing with customers here who go i just you know kind of figure out how to complete this form or or, or change my personal details you know i've lost my job i'm in furlough um i can't make the payment um you know really you know, customers in a real state of panic and and anxiety and so you know the leaders were more likely to have the culture in place with the people who are more able to to respond to that and, and yes, they also had the technologies in place, such as cloud technologies, to enable them to manage that um, transition better. Um, post that period, you know, it's it's definitely been a case then of productivity. You know, are my agents doing what they're meant to be doing, um, or are they just calling themselves at the call center and then putting themselves on hold for an hour and <laughs> doing something else? You know, how do I know <laughs> that? And that was, and that's, you know, that is a, I've heard that as a genuine, you know, example. It's not, oh. I'm not just making that up. Um, oh. and, and so, yeah, big question. Are my agents doing the right thing? So productivity was a key question. And I think we've kind of now moved that into a phase of, well, actually, you know, to be honest, this company is not going to be making the same amount of revenue as it was six months ago. And it's not going to be in six months time either. We've got declining revenues. I've got to do more with less. I've got to maintain this level of productivity, but now I'm into this kind of cost reduction phase. So I really then start starting to now look at different customer interaction channels. But you know, kind of where does it all start? It starts with people, it starts with leadership. I think organizations that are playing catch up, if they do, if they do this the right way, the first thing they're doing is you know, they've got a tight budget, but they're going to invest more in people initiatives first, I think, before they invest in customer initiatives. I promise I'll be a, a more positive. Post mm. shortly, but I'm, I'm kind of interested just as we look back now, because obviously this this period that we're living through now is going to be in the textbooks one day is the COVID era, era and yeah. the, the time that we learned all this and the cat times that were. So if we yeah. look back, what have people, you, you're obviously dealing with an array of organisations, both both of Steve and Ryan, um, just from the sort of rubbernecking perspective, 
what what have people been doing wrong? Um, are there any mistakes people made early on in terms of trying to stay with their customers and and sort of keep their employees on board? Ryan, did you have any um, thoughts on what people maybe did, uh, did erroneously at the start of all this? Yeah, I think there were two kind of broad mistakes that companies made. I think one is being wed to your existing processes. So saying like, this is how we do things. We now do them the exact same way in this remote work world. So I think, you know, Steve's point around like, hey, we're really focused on phone. We're going to really nail people on average handle time and, you know, the same metrics and the same methodologies that we've always done. But now in this remote work work, work world, uh, I think that that was a recipe for one burnout so that a lot of people saw attrition of agents where they just couldn't handle, you know, all the other stresses going on in their lives. Uh, and, and also led to poor quality of service because once again, processes had to be broken uh, based on the way people were working. So that was one. I think the second was not being open and transparent with your customers. I think the organizations that were very transparent say, hey, look, it, we're, we're going through a hard time just like you are. Um, you know, hold times are gonna be longer. Here's a better way to get an answer quicker. Um, you know, a lot of companies even, you know, when you would call in would pre-record a message that says, you know, our staffing levels are only 25%. You know, a better a better method might be going and doing chat on our website or using our self-service page. Um, so I think being kind of open and transparent with your customers, because pe people are empathetic. They know things are hard. Uh, but mm. for companies that kind of tried to hide from that and just try to put on a happy face, uh, I felt like oftentimes did themselves a disservice because they set the wrong expectation with customers. Also, they felt almost like there was a, a period where customers might be more empathetic and sympathetic about it, but the novelty of it all wore off and said, so, okay, you, you got your stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, I think that's Willis speaking of being here. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Yeah. I was going to say, Steve, did you um, just um, dealing with organisations here? Because you you work across different sectors, I think, with yeah. with the different challenges in that regard. Um, people trying to trying to do the right thing early on, and and any mistakes that you think people have already able to learn from. Yeah, look, I think you know we've seen a you know obviously you know in in, the, in that first phase, um, you know different organisations had very different demands, and and they have since gone through different peaks and troughs. So let's just use airlines as one example there. You know, clearly people had, you know, there were lots of people trying to contact airlines very early on. I don't imagine that call volume in airlines is what it is today. On the, on the other hand, you know, government departments, you know, again, are just an incredible spike in volumes. And so, you know, the, just the load capacity to handle that call volume had to be ramped up. And, and, and clearly, you know, the vendors really kind of had to step up here as well. And, and and help those 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 customers and I think that's where you know I've, 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 there's been some incredible um, uh, uplifts and, and and response to that demand and, and and the technology I think has generally delivered on that um, the biggest fails that I've seen is it's been this kind of switch to digital um, you know uh, many organizations have had to turn the phones off particularly those you know who've had to outsource who have outsourced um, you know, we were doing a piece of work for a, uh, a client at the time, um, and we were mystery shopping their, their um, Manila contact center as Manila, Manila went into lockdown. And, and they did a great job of keeping it going until lockdown, and then everything was, you know, switched off, and we could no longer do that mystery shopping piece. I mean, they were maintaining standards. So everybody for that client was switched over to digital. The issue often is that the the knowledge base for digital was written pre-covid so you know to the to the to, you know to this point about self-service you know faqs faqs weren't written for, for for covid so for me the big fail was switching to digital and not updating the knowledge base because everyone but that's not my question my question's not there you know mm -hmm. and and i think that's the biggest customer gripe can somebody answer this question it's more complicated. It's more nuanced. Mm, thank you to the people watching. They've already started sending some questions to and um, um, Catherine on here really cuts to the chase, which kind of kicks us forward to say, are you seeing organisations investing in EX and CX projects at this stage, or are they still just talking about it, nervous to spend money rather than approving projects? Because this talks, goes to what yeah. we're talking about. And um, Steve, I'll go to you first because you were, you were shaking your head there. Yeah, I partly answered it before in terms of EX being the priority. First, mm. you have to have great EX to have 
great CX. And that was something that we already knew pre-COVID through all of the work that we do in terms of benchmarking performance. And the hallmark of a leader is that they focus, but I probably give equal priority to EX, but they start with EX, they start with leadership and start with people. But, you know, kind of the reason why I'm shaking my head is because, you know, to the point about are people still nervous? You can't afford to be nervous. You've got to make a decision now. Um, in the past, people would put this off, put this off, et cetera, kick it down, you know, kick it further down the track. Um, you can't kick it down the track. You've got to make a call now. And people, yes, nervous about making a bad decision. And yes, if you make a bad decision, it will probably come back to bite you. But you have to make that decision. Mm, uh, Ryan, are you seeing organizations more willing to open the wallets? Yeah, well, I, and I think there certainly is. Um, uh, people are being smart about how they spend. But I would say that where there is pain, people want to spend. I, I think I agree with Steve of rather than thinking about it as like a big digital transformation project. So it's like, oh, we need to go for a big round of funding and we're going to go, you know, plan out some 18 month project. They're saying, here's my pain. You know, where's my aspirin? Where, where's my solution to the pain? And when they find it, they will spend on it, then they'll iterate. So those can be, once again, simple things of, hey, we want to build a, a simplistic, better, you know, AI powered FAQ, or we want to invest in some new tool for our employee, or, you know, we want to move something to the, from, you know, into the cloud. So I think people are very poignant and pointed on their spend, um, but typically, once again, it's for a direct pain or a direct issue. Um, yeah, but I, I mentioned, sorry, go ahead, Steve, go ahead. I was going to just, just add to that. I think I'm also kind of seeing a lot of people I'm speaking to are just having um, RFQ overload right now, as in, you know, I think every vendor here is, that's already performed well is now getting, you know, RFQs through. In, so that, that's an indication that there's spend and the turnaround time on those, you know, on those RFQs, are, it's it's days instead of months. So, yeah, so people are are actually looking to, to actually do something. I was going to, it was mentioned just before about um, the, the knowledge base and, and the self-service elements of customer service. So I'll turn to Ryan first on this one. How um, capable are sort of bots proving to be? Because a lot of organizations have dabbled with them over the time without it necessarily being talked about as a replacement for contact centers. Um, do you think we're going to see them playing a greater role? Are we already seeing them playing a greater role? So, uh we are currently seeing them definitely playing a bigger role. Um, personally, I logged me in. We created a rapid response bot uh, that you could deploy on your website by yourself within a matter of hours. Um, but to Steve's point, you know, content is king. Um, just as if you have to train your employee, you have to tell the bot what to say. Um, it can be very impactful for dealing with those high volume, kind of lower value requests of how do I cancel? You know, what have your hours changed? Um, you know, where's the best place for me to go for this information? Um, good tools, well-defined tools, uh, like the ones we make, uh, are really good at helping you understand those insights of where the bot's working well and where it's not. Um, and I think you don't want to turn this into a very large, uh, complex project where, you know, to build a conversational, highly conversational uh, chat bot, you know, can take some time. You have to oftentimes do some integrations with backend systems. While those can be very valuable, you want to be really smart about, is that use case one that's going to be around in a week or a month? So you're not doing that work, and then two weeks from now, the, the target has shifted. Whereas there are simpler FAQ bots that really are just question, answer, question, answer, that you can implement that can really divert volume and also provide a more up-to-date and consistent answer that even maybe your employees may not have. So, so, so yeah, I think they certainly have an impact. I think also there's a great value of having some of these bots facing your employees. So if you're not, let's say, super comfortable about putting a bot on your website, um, you can also have a bot behind the scenes that your employees can be asking questions of, whether those are customer service questions, policy questions, or even, you know, IT questions. So, hey, I'm working from home now. I, you know, you sent me a laptop. Um, you know, my monitor isn't working, or I can't connect to VPN, or... You know, you, you deployed some new tool and it didn't install correctly. So bots can also be really impactful for employee-facing use cases just as much as they can for customer-facing. And how do, you, how do you get the user experience right? I mean, what the, what's the sort of level of expectation that you're seeing from, I both guess, internal users and external customers when, when you deploy it? Are people expecting them to be better than they can be still, or are, are people getting more realistic? So I, I would say some of that's also how you set expectations. So, you know, one thing you can do with a bot or with any kind of these experiences, say, you know, have a welcome green that says, I'm good at doing these things. 
Um, and then if you and if someone you know pushes the boundaries, the bot can then say, hey, I need to pull in a human to help you with this. So some of it's setting expectations. I also think some of it comes down to demographics. So what does your customer base look like? Um, you know, millennials, uh, you know, anybody really, you know, under the age of 40 is quite comfortable with using messaging platforms. So they're used to, you know, short snippets of information, question, answer, question, answer. So it, it kind of goes back to your customer base and the use case. So what are you trying to have the person do? Um, I, I think in general, adoption we've seen has been very positive. Um, prior to COVID, we had customers who had outstanding NPS scores with things like chat and chatbots and negative NPS scores with things like email, and they had decided to eliminate email as a channel. Um, so a lot of this comes down to, you know, once again, the use case, setting expectations, and then making the use cases you're, you're focused on work really well. Um, that, yeah. that really comes down to it. Of, you know, if you're delivering the customer the outcome they need, typically they'll, they'll work in whatever channel. Um, but it comes down to, are you getting them to the solution they need in a timely fashion? And if you're not, cool. they're going to be frustrated and they're going to hit you up across a lot of different channels. Yeah, Steve, what's the um, deployment like of, of this kind of thing? People be watching this thinking, you know, we probably need to, to get moving on this kind of thing. How easy is it to, um, to, to get these set up with all the content that Ryan mentioned that you need? Well, you're absolutely right there. It's, the, it's, it's not so much the technology, the customer facing technology well that, that is important and having it set up for the right use case but it is what sits at the back end it's only as good as the you know the content that sits there so you kind of have to start there and and, and you know obviously in terms of the deployment of ai um our research at the start of the year our customer experience maturity research showed that 31 percent of organizations that we interviewed were using ai in some capacity now and 45% are investigating to deploy it over the next 12 months. Again, I think COVID's only just accelerated that trend. Um, you know, of those who, who are using chatbots, um, again, which again is similar kind of percentages um, to AI deployment, um, we found that around a third of them, this is organizations, not customers rating, but a third gave themselves a score of, of nine or 10 out of 10 in terms of how they're um, bots performing that wasn't the top performing channel but in, as a new channel you know that's that's a good that's a good level of performance and most of the others were giving a seven or an eight so you know it's it you know from an organizational perspective it's performing well um research we did for log me in last year um which we featured in a webinar showed that customers expect to be told they're actually to your question about the ux i think you know customers have an expectation to be told they're interacting with a bot rather than a human. I think that should be kind of embedded in best practice. Um, and and it, I think when people know they're interacting with a bot, we're finding that people are, are a little bit more forgiving to begin with because the kind of expectations are you know, um, quite low. I think the other dimension, you know, there, there is, an, as, as, as bots become more mature and AI deployment becomes more mature and more sophisticated, I think there's an expectation that this is developed with ethics right at the forefront. And, and unfortunately, I think that we've had a short history of AI deployment um, where the ethics have just not been present whatsoever. Um, and, you know, in Australia, we now have um, you know, ethical guidelines and principles that, um, you know, a number of leading organizations are really kind of supporting. Um, but again, I think to just get over some of the customer resistance that's out there, um, ethics have to be central to the, um, to the future deployment of AI. I was, I was going to say you were, you were talking about doing the um, um, quality control testing on overseas call centres um, before lockdown hit, Steve. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've got any views on what happens if and when we, we come, come through all of this in terms of how this will permanently change the way people look to both reach out and, and deal with incoming customer inquiries. Have we seen yeah. the end of this massive era of offshore call centers and what, how do you think it will all play out and, and rather than just do this being something we're doing to get through a period where they're actually thinking about longer term changes well look, I, I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny around offshoring and how it's been handled um you know I, I think i would expect to see some level of you know government scrutiny regulatory scrutiny around around that how that's been handled I'm not sure how that's going to play out but, but certainly I do think it's going to be, you know, looked at very, um, very closely. Um, you know, are we going to, is this a permanent shift? Um, I, I think it, 
it's some things are going to are absolutely going to be here to stay you know i think we are feeling very uncomfortable about person to person interactions right now i don't think we're going to get over that um, and i think you know digital is going to fill the void um but it has to be designed um very carefully and i, I think this is where ux is going to be is 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 going to be critical um you know i think i think that we've you know i think we've we've been it, it still it still sits as a very you know it's a it's a cost saving measure rather than a a customer engaged a customer driven measure and i think when it's driven by the need to cut costs again i think mistakes are going to be made um whereas i think if it's if it's driven with the needs of the customer the use cases that ryan um talked about and really kind of starting with the the use cases starting you know with with essentially what i would call an out an outside in rather than an inside out approach you will get a better outcome for the customer and you will still get the right outcomes for the organization ryan did you want to jump in there about the sort of longer term changes of this way of dealing with with customers yeah i, th I think the the big thing we're seeing there's a, there's an aha that's happening with companies and i'll give you a couple examples of where they can deliver a, a better experience, even though it's virtual. Uh, and, and, and then therefore they're rethinking, well, what do we want that future model to look like? So the two examples I'll give you is one is in the world of field service. So many of us have experienced, you know, our telco, our cable provider, um, you know, comes to our house and installs a box, uh, our cable box or our modem. And in the current environment, you can't do that, or it's very, you know, it's, it's challenging to do it. So uh, we, we worked on some technology around camera sharing. We have a product called uh, Rescue Live Lens. And now instead of the technician having to be standing next to the customer, the customer can point their smartphone uh, without downloading anything you know, at the box that they received in the mail or that someone dropped off on their front porch. And now the expert sitting back in their home office, safe and protected, no longer is doing these truck drives from location to location to do something pretty simplistic of, you know, plug in a cable here, plug it into the wall, watch the lights blink, watch it restart, and now you're off and running. So now we're taking our valuable asset of that expert technician and making them more scalable. The customer's happier because now there isn't the, well, they'll be there between, you know, 10 a.m. and noon um, because now it's, you know, a much more on demand. It's, hey, you're next in the queue. Would you like to have your, you know, your session start in five minutes or start in an hour? Um, so there's, there's, there's some flexibility there. Um, and uh, we have efficiencies because now we can do more appointments in a day. So, so one is I, I think there's this opportunity to change our business processes to be better and more efficient for the customer and the employee. Um, two, also thinking about changing some of our workflows. You know, in the past, um, I just went through a refinancing process on our home, and you know there was a lot of paperwork shuffle, and oftentimes we have to go into the branch and deal with paperwork. You know, how do we now optimize that to a better digital workflow? And how are we then, you know, helping our agents see what the customer's seeing? So in the old model, they, you know, they'd be sitting next to them across the table. Now our, our agent or our, 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 uh, our you know, financial advisor is seeing what the person's seeing on their screen with the appropriate stuff blocked out. So we're maybe not seeing those social security number or some sensitive information. But, you know, just as if we were both looking at the same sheet of paper and I'm saying, review this, sign here, you know, initial here, I'm now seeing what they're seeing on their screen as the employee, but I'm doing that in the safety of my own home. And so once again, we're, we're kind of making better business processes that make it easier and more flexible for the user, because I can see their screen, I can help them through onboarding or, you know, through a document flow, but I'm doing that at scale in a way that makes it more efficient for the employee and more efficient for the customer. So these are some of like the kind of tools or technologies that have made things better and I think will become the, the, the kind of future state, the ongoing yeah. best practice that we won't revert, excuse me, revert back to the old model. Mm. There was um, a, a question that um, popped up a little while ago. It's, it was obviously specific of interest to one of the audience members um, uh, called Lisa. Uh, and and, she, and she's, she's asking about if we're starting to use all these new technologies to um engage with customers and answer questions what can the marketing department be doing to support and promote the way that we're working during COVID and, and in the new normal from a customer and experience perspective and I'll, I'll flip back to you ryan on that one first if, you, if, I, if i may 
Yeah, there's a variety of things marketing can do. Um, so, so one is certainly things around customer onboarding. You know, retention is such a huge factor in this current environment, both of keeping your customers happy. You know, it costs, you know, there's great Forrester research that it costs three to five X the, the amount of money to acquire a new customer versus retain an existing customer. So as dollars become tighter in marketing budgets, you know, we want to keep our customers happy. So certainly a technology like a, like a co-browse technology uh, can help with uh, you know, helping that customer through a journey, um, whether that be better understanding your product, an onboarding process, a rollout of a new feature. So there's a variety of ways marketing can help get the company closer and in a better way to the customer. I also think there's a great opportunity when you look at things like bots for marketing to get the latest information in the employee's hands. Going back to Steve's point, if we're not focused on EX and enabling our employees and giving them what they need to be successful with the latest and greatest information, then they're inherently gonna fall down for our customers. So, so much of marketing is just kind of the scale of, of the message. And I think a lot of these tools can really help to get the right message in front of the employee so they can better service that customer, whether it be hours or offers or deals or you know our, our latest message around cancellation policies. Um, there's a lot that marketing can do as a, as a scale engine through some of these new technologies. Yeah, Steve, do you have any insights there on what you think um, the marketing teams can be doing to maybe better engage or better assist the, the technical people in the background? Well, look, marketing's always been the home of customer insight and knowing who the customer is. Um, I just think now that marketing needs to completely double down on that. And so that means having a really detailed understanding of the customer journey and the pain points in that journey. Um, understanding how that varies by different customer personas, knowing who your customer personas are, developing empathy maps, utilizing all of the insight from that and not just retaining it within marketing, but ensuring all of that is shared fully across the organization so that people in a in more of a field support sales or service role then utilize you know, the, the insights um, and, and, and it's activated uh, rapidly um, with, with, within the organization. Um, you know, to Ryan's point about much more targeted, much more personalized communications, um, you know, that's, that's, that's critical that we that, that was happening pre-COVID. I think it only has to happen even more because there's nothing more irritating than something that's a communication from an organization that's completely um, tone deaf. Um, I've no idea why Uber Eats keeps telling me about offers in South Africa. I went there two years ago, had a great holiday, but I live in Australia and so great offers on 50% off my next order on, in South African runs don't really kind of help. Um, but yeah, I just think it's that more, you know, I just think it's more, you know, stop being tone deaf, um, be, be more personalized, be more empathetic um, and utilize the insight. To pull yeah, that was one of the things that I wanted to, to raise. We, we, we spoke earlier about this period where customers and, and employees were, I guess, understanding of the, the unusual position that businesses were in trying to get things sorted. We're, we're kind of through that period now where good enough isn't just good enough and, and, and people start to think about optimizing the experience. I mean, what, how, how are you um, seeing organizations um, attempting to stand out now rather than just keep the wheels spinning so much? Actually, um, surprise, uh, there's a question that came from the chat that's kind of, uh, along, along, alongside that from, from Danielle, a very good point um, that people often think that they have to be told what they want from their customers and, and their employees, and, but you, you actually need to get out ahead of what people know that they need already. Um, so how, how are you seeing both, well, how's Lob Me In doing this, Ryan? Because obviously as a tech company, you're, you're trying to be offering what people don't know they need yet, um, but also organizations um, sort of optimizing what they're doing rather than just being good enough. So uh, I think there's a number of things you can do on this front. It's a great question. I, and I totally agree that we're in a world where um, it's no longer about just good enough. You know, the, 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 there's, uh, Forrester also has a really great uh, diagram of if you're continuing to do the same thing, you will eventually stop delighting your customers. The curve continues to go up and to the right. Uh, and so I, I completely agree with the sentiment. One, so from a log me in perspective, um, we've done a number of different things. One is we've really focused on less around um, us solving a specific problem and then just waiting for the next problem to arise, but rather how do you think about all the different capabilities you have and how do you bring those together to deliver a better outcome for that company? So 
uh, we have a lot of, um, we, have, um, we did an emergency remote work kit that we had developed for our customers that included uh, collaboration tools like GoToWebinar we're using today or GoToMeeting. It also included IT remote support tools. So, you know, what are some of the things you may be running into around managing a device or, you know, break fixing an employee's phone because they need it for email. Um, it also included uh, capabilities around security because you, you want to do this in a way that, that, you know, doesn't put your company or your customers at further risk. So I think kind of staying ahead of your customer of, you know, learning through this of what's that path look like. And, you know, Steve used a good point of like the maturity. So what does that CX or EX maturity look like in this environment? And how do we help to line up those pieces for our customers? So they're, they're delighted that we're kind of ahead of them. I think it's certainly one. Um, and then from, from more of a, a, a broader perspective around optimization, using the data to identify what's the next thing. So whether you're you know, digging through transcript data from a chat or using your bots to um, identify leading indicators. Uh, we're starting to get questions around this topic and we're not, you know, the outcome is not what the customer is expecting or we're seeing a lot of escalations or you know, something we wanted to self-service now is requiring agents to get involved. So using some of the content and conversations as leading indicators of what's coming down the pipeline um, is another interesting area where you can garnish uh, micro moments to, to, to identify macro trends. And we've seen that be a really common, uh, a common uh, outcome in the conversations we're having with our clients. Mm, a lot of the um, ideas of uh, maybe risk taking or um, um, coming up with something really innovative new, maybe whether you're in the marketing department or in the tech development team, um, in the pre-COVID era, you'd come up with an idea like that and then you'd turn to the people next to you and say, what do you think of this and get some, uh, and I'm not necessarily sure that the um, collaboration tools, certainly maybe even where I'm working at the financial review, it's, it's not the same as just having a, a quick flick to someone sat to your left. How, how, are, you, how are you seeing organisations um, continue to do this sort of innovative work where people may be putting themselves out there, coming up with a new idea and thinking this might be a bit stupid, this might be genius. How are you seeing this kind of thing work um, in the era where we're all sort of sat in our, in our own studies at home wondering if, we, if anyone's really out there? Uh, I, it's a great question. I, I'd be interested in Steve's perspective on this also. So one thing uh, we're doing at LogMean is we're really promoting uh, test and learn. So let's get, rather than us, to your point, I think in the past it'd be a, some risk aversion of, hey, let's better vet this. Let's do focus group study. Let's you know do a smaller sample size through an alpha or a beta to better understand adoption. I think now we, we let the market do a lot more of that dictating. Um, we also uh, are doing really interesting things with you know collaboration tools like Slack um, and other you know uh, other ways of kind of crowdsourcing information, where we'll you know put a proposal forward, we'll look at market data, um, we'll you know have a, a kind of a hypothesis, and then we'll try to validate that hypothesis through either customer data or market data, or even you know getting a set of experts in the room to try to accelerate its path to market. Um, but I think it's it's much more about letting the market help you help give you faster feedback loops um, and spend less time in kind of some of that internal bureaucracy. Yes, Steve, did you have some thoughts there? Yeah, I think the point about you know co-creation, collaboration applies both internally as well as externally. So I think there's you know I think again a lot of organisations yeah trying to figure out how our teams internally. Um, can work together, but equally, you know, a, a lot of the work that we do for clients is, a, and, and then how do we bring the customer into this co-creation exercise? And again, you know, traditionally, you know, that would have been done in a in a, in a physical environment. Um, it's easier to manage, you know, that that collaboration in, internally with internal teams. I'm not, I'm not saying it's it's easy, but it's easier than bringing the customer into that into that conversation and so i think for me the big challenge is going to be about is about going beyond what you know what what ryan just identified from those you know great examples of how we collaborate internally to how we bring the customer in particularly from an innovation process perspective um you know what's the how do we run co-creation um workshops how do we run those ideation sessions how do we test that um with with customers using the new tools 
um, that we have. And I think all of that is entirely, you know, possible. Um, but I think we need to think from first principles in terms of how we how we manage that, because I think, you know, the organisations that figure that out quickly and deploy that um, quickly and effectively with their customers are going to be the ones that start to, again, come back with more of those um, breakthrough innovations in service and, and products and so on. That's ultimately going to give them that competitive advantage. One of the big changes to the way that we're all dealing with this period is exactly what we're doing right now. So it's sitting in our um, in our in our studies or our, our kitchen tables, having conversations around the world. Um, and we've we've heard a lot of talk about things like Zoom fatigue and, and things like the people struggling to have these back-to-back -back meetings and have the sessions where it's almost a a fake reality. I mean, I'm very smart above the waist at the minute but I'm, I'm not standing up I'm, I'm just gonna, so it's just not not real life so to speak um what I'm, i guess the, the obvious person to, to direct this to is ryan is what work is being done to try and sort of smooth out some of these problems where people almost feel like they're living a fake existence and and they're doing their job to a point but then it's it's much more tiring to just have a chat than it would have been in the past is, is there's a lot of work going on to try and smooth out some of these issues yeah, there, there is. So, so we have a whole, you know, part of our, our at, at log me in. You know, we have go to meeting and go to webinar and we have products like go to room. So, if you look at kind of pre March, we were spending a lot of time on what are the tools. You know, think about when you walk into a typical conference room. You know, it's a whole battle of I got to connect my device and I got to do this, and it's like there's a lot of friction, which is unfortunate. So, you know, we create a product called Go to Room which was about you walk in, you get going. The meeting starts you know, in a matter of seconds and, and, and you're up and running and everything's connected and you can add your device and yada, yada, yada. Um, but now we're in a world where, how do we create that similar, reduce that friction in this environment? So just as you said, when there's, you know, in the past, there'd be somebody sitting next to me and I could just yell over at them or tap them on the shoulder. And not just, you know, you can certainly tap someone on the shoulder in, in something like Microsoft Teams or Slack, but you don't have that quick kind of escalation to higher order conversations. So that's something else that we're working on is how do we make that technology really easy? So it's not like, well, I got to set up my webcam and I got to share my screen and I got to do this and I got to do that. So we're working on how do we you know, make the technology reduce all those friction points. But I think the other thing too is even outside the technology, there's a lot of also um, not always using the tool to be productive. Uh, and I think something we tried to do both from a, from a people perspective is, you know, do things where you still have that human side of it. Uh, just the other day, we did a, a, a team family feud where we all got on video and we all kind of just had fun playing the game of family feud. Uh, um, and, uh, and, you know, we had a bunch of topics and we all joked around and it was kind of that breaking down the barrier of like, Hey, I'm on, uh, you know, I'm doing a video conference and it's about, you know, another reporting or another session about planning or another session around me showing my, you know, my presentation. I think it's how, how do we also make this so that we feel like we're still interacting as humans? Um, and, and the same thing if you have, you know, agents in call centers or employees in the office that, you know, now are working from home. It's how do we keep that human relationship um, through the lens of technology? And do you, do you see the user experience of all of this change? Uh, Steve, you're welcome to join in on this as well. Yeah, we, we've yeah. seen one of the sort of big vendors introduced this thing where you're all in a room together rather than on squares on a screen. You, you've sort of positioned in an auditorium together. It's, it's kind of an interesting idea. I don't know if it's just a gimmick or if it's mm. uh, if it will actually change the way I feel. Um, do you see a um, chance to evolve this this interface that we're all getting used to? Yeah, look, I, I, you need to be careful of the gimmicks, that's for sure. Um, I think the, you know, the, the evolution for me comes around things like, you know, what you can do, you, you can use the data from the, the, the meeting to improve the product. So there's a lot that we can use AI here for from, from a, a facial analytic perspective, body language, how people are reacting, how people are responding, um, voice analytics. So all of, we, we had all of these tools pre-COVID, right? These are not new tools, we just need to use them more intensely. So again, you know, conversational analytics, um, all of that can be done to ultimately optimize the experience. And, 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 and so you can kind of do kind of UX as you go here. You don't have to do, you know, you don't have to design a, you know, a UX study to develop the product because this is the, the, this is the world's greatest social experiment. Um, 
at scale across every country. You can do this, you know, you can compare by country, you can compare by business size. You've got all the data in the world now that you need to analyze all of these interactions to come up with a much better product and, and service. And, you know, yeah, okay, fatigue is kind of this one aspect of, you know, I don't think it's the fatigue bit, because it's just, that's just back to back meetings. I don't think, it, yeah, you go to work in the old day, you know, you went and had back to back meetings, you were fatigued. You do it in Zoom or whatever, you know, it's, it's you're going to be fatigued. So I don't think there's an issue about the, the, the technology per se that's causing the, the, the fatigue. But I do think there's a really kind of great opportunity to optimize the experience to drive that higher level of employee um, engagement. Mm. Uh, I, I just want to point out that as always with these things, we're running out of time yeah, when I, I still got a list of questions. So if you yeah. if you sat at home or even in an office uh, watching this and, and we, we've not covered something that you really wanted, uh, get the fingers moving and get a question in there and, we, and we'll get to it before, before the end. Um, I was just going to, before, before that, I was going to talk about the sort of changing the, 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 the dealing with customers perspective as well, because I mean, we're talking about these meetings internally, but also this idea of um, sort of engaging with people that you want to sell to and, and you want to market yeah. to outside of an organisation. The, sort of the, the avenue of just bumping into people or um, having these networking events where, where yeah. you, you, you sidle over is, is kind of gone. Um, how, how's that... Um, Sort of translating to the to the new normal, do you think, Steve? Yeah, look, I think we we've just completed a study of marketers um, focuses around content marketing. So we've we've not published it yet, but we've kind of close to publishing this report. It's really interesting. This was this was, has been conducted. The field was conducted during COVID. We there's been a, a huge shift in marketing budgets from events to content. So content is now the number one priority. I think we said 79% um, um, said that content is their priority and it's their number one priority. Um, events is now number four behind advertising and PR. Um, and 45% said that content will, spending on content is going to increase as a consequence of COVID. Um, and 47% said they, they, they're going to decline their spending on events. So this is you know, so content is going to be the way in which organisations start to build those relationships. Yes, and ultimately supported with with salespeople. Um, but the first goal is to engage your customers in a B two B setting um, with your content. And we all know there's so much content out there. So you, we've got content overload as well. I mean, it's great. We've got a fun. We're creating audience. content right now, Steve. Correct, and we've got a great audience for that. So we're obviously we're, we're nailing it. I hope. Uh, but you know, this is this is exactly this is this is exactly a live kind of case study of content to create those relationships. And and this is going to I mean, again, we were doing it pre-COVID, but we're just doubling down, tripling down on content moving forward. That's the way. That's the way it's going to be done. And how, how are you seeing it, uh, Ryan, as well? Because you obviously um, deal with it um, from Logmin's perspective. Events like this maybe in the past would have all been in a hotel together having a conversation but now you know we're having this you're, you're still over over at home we're still at home and and this content can live forever and be re-enjoyed because it's recorded and that kind of thing um how are you seeing this sort of idea of sort of building a marketing position and also engaging customers yeah so uh, we actually we did an annual event and we turned it virtual so it was in may early may and uh, we learned a lot through doing it. We had very high engagement. We, we exceeded our expectations. Uh, the event was called CX Next. And actually, mm -hmm. I, I invite everybody to go check it out, cxnext.com. We have everything recorded. I think the big thing is um, in a world where uh, you can have an in-person event, people can consume in different ways. So they can go to a networking event and have lots of quick conversations. They can go see a keynote. You know, They can go to a deep dive session that's maybe more about you know real practitioner uh, capabilities. I think what can be hard in the current environment is you, you don't wanna do a one size fits all on content. So you wanna think about where is this content gonna be consumed? Who's consuming it? What's their objective? Whether that's marketing content, you know, in product education, um, you know, even cross sell or retention of customers. Uh, you know, people are busy and I, I think about myself, you know, I have three monitors in my office. There's lots of stuff coming across my desk every day. So how are we taking our content and putting it in a format that uh, gets the best outcome? And that outcome could be step one of many steps. And I think this is where people get kind of hung up 
of the, the you can't think about through the old mental model of you know i'm gonna do a white paper or i'm gonna do a long format you know this webinar it's great but we may want to create smaller snippets of this webinar or social mm -hmm. posts or some insights that if someone wants to you know if they have the hour and they, they're excited to dig in great they may only have five minutes or three minutes or 30 seconds so how do we take all this goodness and distill it down to the places to places where either our customer has pain a uh, prospect has pain uh, or someone's kind of looking to up their game so i think that's the oh. big thing of and even when you look at a, a broader cx you know what's best delivered through faqs or an faq widget what's delivered through a conversational bot what's best delivered through an agent in chat versus a phone call those are all many different ways of giving a similar answer but you want to optimize around what's the objective and the outcome that we want to deliver through those channels and being thoughtful in that way i think oftentimes leads to a much better customer experience and employee experience i also think we thrive, we thrive forward I'm, i mean how what's the best way for organizations to be making decisions about which of these changes to operate and do a permanent i mean i i was i went out down the road yesterday and saw my local um bank branch has, has just closed uh, and they and they're the, the sign on the window instead of usually says now go to xx down the road it was directing you to download the apps and, and all that kind of, and kind of thing and, and there was an address but they were clearly pushing you to to this way and that, that's a permanent change and they've obviously worked out that they didn't need it there anymore and i couldn't remember i was saying to my wife i can't remember the last time i went in there anyway um so, so how are the you seen organizations changing what's going to be permanently virtual and what's going to be you know this is just this period and then we're going to get back to normal and we, we are running out of time so we better be brief I'll, I'll go to you first right yeah i think the big thing is um you know test and learn so uh, before you make big big change let the data or get something in the market to validate your hypothesis uh, i think with anything it's let the market prove it out um, and do it just enough that it's a, a good enough experience and then continue to invest in what's working uh, you know, I think the example there is, you know, you hadn't been in the branch in a long time. They probably saw that as a macro trend and they said, hey, the market's proved it out. You know, let's go take those dollars and invest them in our mobile app because that's where the market is today. So I think let the market tell you and uh, and test and learn from those tests as fast as possible because usually it will prove itself out. Um, and that's where I think we've seen the, the the best outcome and also break things. You know, break them in a way that doesn't upset the customer, but don't be burdened by your existing processes by saying, well, we've always done it that way, so we always have to keep doing it that way. I think, tr you know, take 10% of your customer base, push them through a new methodology and see if it actually, you know, leapfrogs the way you've been doing things today. Well, Steve, do you have any thoughts as well? Well, we're definitely pre-COVID, we're already seeing a trend towards organizations decreasing their investment in person-to-person -person, um, customer interaction channels. Um, so that was already happening. I think that's certainly going to accelerate. But the other trend that we were seeing pre-COVID was this level of higher level of integration between physical and digital channels. So they don't sit there as separate channels. And again, I think where you're going to retain some physical, you know, person-to-person -person touch point, um, the, that's going to transform what's left of that um, bricks and mortar is going to we've seen that in retail all already but that, again that trend is only going to accelerate that the integration of digital and and and, and physical Ooh. now before we hand that i think cassia from the trans tasman business circle is going to come on and wrap things up in a minute but um before mm. before she appears in our, our virtual words again there she is um we were i was going to um ask just if we if we look forward um over the next say 12 months and now it seems impossible at the moment without um without the obvious of you know finding a vaccine or a cure for the virus um what are you hoping and expecting when you look ahead over the year um what do you think is going to change and what you hope it will change and how we all deal with each other I'll, I'll get to steve first before we give ryan the last word well i think you know we, we're going to have very divergent experiences over the next 12 months so what i hope for is going to be you know obviously informed by my own perspective but there's going to be you know a group of people for whom this has been actually a pleasant surprise um, they probably really enjoyed a lot more family time. They really enjoyed work-life balance. They're seeing lots of new opportunities. They're learning new things, you know, and it's, you know, and I think that enabling all of that is going to be tremendously exciting and something I'm going to look forward to. The other experience, which sits diametrically opposite that, you know, essentially there's like, you know, there's, there's two movies at play here. If you're watching this other movie, it's isolation, it's mental health, it's illness, 
and its unemployment. And for me, you know, I think it's about making sure that we retain that level of high level of empathy, particularly for those people who are going to do it tough over the next 12 months. Mm, that's a good point. Sir. And Ryan, just to use final. Yeah, I think it's very well said by Steve. Uh, I would say it comes down to our people. Um, at the end of the day, when we're in a world where we're more remote, whether we're more remote dealing with our customers, more remote dealing with our employees, um, if we're not investing in our people and tools and technology and processes that helps them feel empowered, helps them feel all the things that Steve just mentioned, uh, I think that's a recipe for failure. And as we lose our people, we lose our edge, we lose that institutional knowledge, we lose that passion for the customer, and we start to then, you know, we move down the hierarchy of needs and we just start worrying about ourselves. Uh, and so I think the big thing is companies really focusing on how are we empowering our teams in a, in a disparate, segmented, remote work world that's highly dynamic to run faster, work smarter, feel empowered. And the companies that do that uh, will have a long-term competitive advantage. They'll have better people that retain those people and they'll outpace their competitors. So I think having that keen eye towards making our employees feel really uh, uh, empowered and, and focused uh, and, and energized will then in turn lead to those great customer outcomes and lead to great business results. Well, um, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ryan, for joining, keeping me company before I log off and have that strange moment when you just click off and you're back in your house. <laughs> yes. we're, we've all got that ahead of us in a few seconds. Um, but um, now I'd like to welcome Cassia back just to, to wrap things up for us in the Trans-Tasman Business Circle. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ryan, for sharing your insights today on the employee experience and the customer experience journey. And thank you again, Paul, for your excellent moderation. And I'd also like to thank our partner, Log Me In. Um, as mentioned earlier, our next briefing in this series will take place on Thursday, the 6th of August, at the same time, 10 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And the link to register has been posted in the chat function. Um, so the topic for the next talk is navigating new ways of working, lessons for what's next, featuring Dr. Joseph Sweeney, who's the advisor, Intelligent Business Research Services, um, and Mark Strassman, Senior Vice President and General Manager, Unified Communications and Collab Collaboration, Lock me in. So thank you again for speaking for us today and for all of those who are tuned in and we look forward to welcoming you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.